Hey, listeners, it's Dan here. I want to tell you about a company that I'm really excited about. It's called Current. It's a fintech company that's completely disrupting traditional banking. I'm a new Current customer. It's already helping me and my entire family manage our finances, all from one easy-to-use app. So try Current for yourself and get the app by going to current.com slash OK. That's current.com slash OK. Current is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by and Visa debit card issued by Choice Financial Group, member FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA, Inc., and can be used everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. Okay, welcome to OK Computer. I am Dan Nathan. Later in the back half of this program, I'm going to be joined by Katie Stanton and Alex Redder, general partners at Moxie Ventures in Boulder, Colorado. But first, someone who needs, I think, little introduction, Jeff Richards, GGV Capital. Jeff, you have been a prolific, I'm going to call you a contributor of OK Computer this year. We really have appreciated all your insights. And I've said this to you time and time again, that one of the things that I find so unique about your perspectives is your handle on both private markets, where you practice specifically in technology, but also your handle on public markets and kind of the intersection of the two. So I really appreciate you coming on. It seems like, you know, every month, it can't be just for the Comos Tequila, can it be? (laughs) It's amazing. I should have a bumper sticker that says, we'll podcast for tequila. There you go. And you found a nice home. So we really appreciate it. And just, you know, shout out. I really enjoyed your unscripted that you do with the GGV community. It's a great pod. And what's the frequency in which that drops? Uh, Once a month or so? Or I try to do them once a week, but it ends up being probably once every other week. And it's on YouTube. You can find it on YouTube under GGV Capital Unscripted. And really the goal there is to give people, it's a video chat, a 30 minute video chat. So it's short, Try to make it kind of hard hitting and kind of give people more of the unprepped, no notes, off the cuff thoughts with people that are leaders in tech. So founders, I did one with Austin Allred from Bloom Tech last week. I did one with Erica Schultz, who's the CRO at Confluent a couple of weeks ago. I did one with Dick Costello, the former CEO of Twitter, you, who you know. I love the format. I think it's really good. I think, listen, you do a lot of content. You pop up. You're one of those guys. You never need to know the topics ahead of time. And I think it's kind of fun that way. And that's also the way that I kind of came into media is on live TV. And you don't get too much heads up there. So listen, I appreciate you popping in. Rick and you have some unfinished business. I think it had something to do with a Warriors Celtics bet. But I'm going to leave that to the next time. Congratulations to your Golden State Warriors. What a heck of a season. And way to round it out. So I'm, I'm happy for you. He was puffing his chest out when it was 2-2. So I got to circle back and make sure I collect on whatever the bet was for. We'll go back and listen and we'll make sure he's not a welcher, that guy. All right, let's talk first a little bit about what's going on in public markets. That is kind of my wheelhouse. And then we'll extrapolate it. We have a bunch of tweets that I'd love to run by you and get your takes on. But one of the things that's really interesting is that sentiment is just seems to be getting worse and worse every week as it relates to publicly traded risk assets. And we're going to hit some stuff in the private markets here. And you've obviously you and Rick and Katie and a lot of our co-hosts and guests over the course of this year have kind of been been indicating you're kind of not being defensive the whole way down. You're trying to be really constructive and seeing what the market conditions are and how, based on your experience, where you see this stuff going. And it's much harder to do, obviously, in private markets, given the illiquidity and the transparency and that sort of stuff. But in public markets, it's funny, you hear that expression all the time, history doesn't always repeat, but it certainly does rhyme. And pattern recognition is a really important sort of thing. And so last week we had the Fed meeting, they surprised to the upside as far as 75 basis point hike versus what was priced in at 50 just a week earlier. And investors had no idea what to make of it. And originally they rallied and then they sold off and then they sold off really, really hard. A lot of people think about what are some signs of capitulation? How close are we getting to a bottom after a really long period? And again, none of these situations are going to be totally comparable. But today, after a long weekend, we're recording this Tuesday afternoon into the close, we're getting a nice bounce. The S&P is up about two and a half percent. The NASDAQ is up a little less than three percent. But I got to tell you, Jeff, there's some things that I find troubling. All the squeezy stuff, the stuff that's down 50 percent of the year, down 60, 70 percent, they're up a lot. But things like Meta, which is Facebook, which was one of the largest tech companies in the world six months ago when the NASDAQ was at its highs, it was trading near a trillion dollar market cap. 
It's down 4% today. It's making new 52-week lows. It's down 60% from those highs. And so help me think about this. When you see that sort of price action, you can say, well, that's just one stock. You know what I mean? But if the market's trying to find a bottom, I'm just curious how you think about that because you own some of these big names. You don't look at them mark to market every day. Give me a sense of how you're feeling about where we are in this downdraft. I guess, and this is related to the way we've been coaching CEOs in the private markets as well, so much of what's happening in the public market right now is disconnected from performance and upside from here. And to me, what I've been telling people is, look, until people have a reason to be positive, they're going to be negative. And we just keep getting negative signals, right? We don't know when the Fed's going to stop raising rates. We don't know when inflation's. We're paying over $7 a gallon for gas here in California. Until you start to see those trends turn the other way, and we have some chatter that maybe we won't keep raising rates in, in the next stratosphere. I just don't think people are going to be in risk on mode. I mean, today, you know more about this than I do. Why the short term bump today after so much negativity last week? And you've still got so many names that are down 70, 80 percent. I mean, you mentioned Meta. Well, Google's down a third as well. Google's not going anywhere. I like Google, Amazon, Apple in terms of big tech, Microsoft better than I do Facebook, just because to me, Facebook has a real regulatory issue, number one. And number two, their bet on VR, which is where Mark wants to take the company, to me, feels squishy. I don't know that that market is as real as he thinks it is. Whereas I know where GCP, Azure, AWS, like the reason you want to own Amazon is because of AWS. We know where that market's going. People are going to continue to consume cloud computing. The usage there is going to keep going up. They're going to want more Snowflake. They're going to want more Confluent. They're going to want more GitLab, HashiCorp, Databricks. The infrastructure layer for tech, to me, I can keep buying that with a lot of confidence, even in a bear market like the one we're in, because I know the upside three to five years down the road. To me, names like Meta are a little squishier. And so I don't own Meta. I famously owned it right after the IPO. I doubled my money and sold it and then missed the rest of the run. So I feel stupid about that one. But I just think right now we've got so much negativity in the market and we haven't really seen, other than the Fed raising rates three quarters of a point, we haven't really seen much action to try and combat it. Our president is calling out big companies for price gouging which doesn't really seem to be the root of the problem. We've got labor shortages. I was just reading an article today. People were asking, why are we having so many problems with the airlines this summer? Well, there were 45,000 less people working for airlines at the end of last year than there were at the beginning of the year. So we've got labor shortages. We've got a supply shortage. And we still continue to have excess demand, which is now cooling. Obviously, you're seeing it in the housing market. Glenn Kelman was on CNBC this morning saying that a quarter of the homes on Redfin now are seeing markdowns. So Maybe we're at the beginnings of a two or three month window where we might get some positive news. But until we do, it's tough to be a buyer. As far as your experience, you were an operator in the 90s and obviously in the 2000s. You've been an investor, both public and private markets now for maybe two decades or so. From my experience, and I'm curious what you think is like, you're much more in tune with operations of businesses and what they should be solving for in all different sorts of economic environments. But in my career, Most of these sorts of hiccups, when they happen, they're much more than one quarter fixes. And that's the one thing that I think it makes sense to be a little bit patient here. And when you just mentioned that Amazon example, it's a company that does a half a trillion dollars in sales. And so you tell me what percentage of that is AWS. And I know the margins on AWS, and I know that what accounts for the profitability of that whole company. The stock is being punished having nothing to do with the part of the business that you love about it. It's being punished because of the spend on the retail business that you can tell me over the last 20 years, that's always been a pillar of the bear case when they spend on prime or they spend on last mile or whatever the heck it is. And that hurts those margins of AWS, which have been around now for 10, 12, 13 years or so. But at this point, the stock is being punished for the retail over expansion. Now, I just make one point though. If all of these companies that have been built with VC capital and zero interest rates over the last, call it five, six, seven years, if a lot of them slow down on their spending, which they are doing, and you're advising companies to do that in the private markets, if a bunch of them go away, you know, Amazon's AWS and Microsoft's Azure and Google's cloud, they're all going to see meaningful deceleration. And that just gives bears another reason to be negative, despite the fact of trading at a relative multiple that you might like. But if the whole market's being re-rated, we're going to be in a period that might go longer than we think. So that's the way I kind of think of it. I think that's fair. You could see some decrease in consumption. And obviously, that's why some of these names have traded lower. 
You're going to also see that in seat-based software. So as a lot of the buyers of software, the aggressive buyers of software and infrastructure are other tech companies. If they reduce headcount, which many have been, then you would see less spending on seat-based software. And we're starting to see some of our CEOs come to us and say, hey, we don't expect as much in terms of upsells this year for seat-based licenses. I guess the thing I think you have to ask yourself again is, am I a trader or am I an investor? If I'm an investor, that trend over the long run, that trend line will be consistently up into the right. And so you may have a down quarter or two on cloud spending, but it's going to be up into the right over the next three to five years. And so as painful as it is to be watching these names go down, I've certainly been a buyer on the way down and I'm continuing to buy, but you know that trend line goes up over the long run. And you talk about Amazon, you look at Amazon right now, if you place a valuation of AWS at about 13 times 2023 revenue, okay, which is not crazy, it might be a little aggressive for where the market is today, assuming 25% year over year growth, you basically are valuing the non AWS part of Amazon at zero. That's the, I'm using math from the last Goldman Sachs report in April. So I'm not saying the retail businesses were zero, but I think the combined retail. By the way, let's also remember logistics. Amazon is building a killer logistics business, right? You see all those Amazon vans driving around your neighborhood. They're building their own infrastructure to do delivery. And you're basically paying the $1.1 trillion for AWS and getting the rest for free. So I just think we're going to look back at this window in time and say, gosh, similar to the way we looked at 08, 09, and similar to the way we looked at March of 2020, there were some historic buying opportunities. It feels very painful in the moment. But I think we'll look back at this as a very solid buying opportunity. Just to get all up in your grill for a second, though, when you just said 13 times a very mature business for that AWS, if I said to you seven, then where should this $1.1 trillion market cap trade? If we can all agree that the market is not going to value that retail business much more than it currently is. So that's the downside scenario again. And I think those sorts of expectations, they take time. We can't bottom in public markets until... We all agree that 13 times sales for a mature business is not appropriate. So that's kind of my take on it. I mean, listen, I look at days like today and, you know, we do a call at midday with the Fast Money panelists, our producers and the host, and we all kind of kick around some ideas and this and that, whatever. And oftentimes on big movement days like this, they'll say, all right, guys, higher or lower by the close or by the time you're seeing us. And it's really funny. I look at a day like today and I see a lot of stuff bouncing because the pessimism was so bad last week or the last few weeks or so, but I don't see a lot of great action, you know, in general here. One other thing I would just mention, we had a lot of companies go public in 2020 and 21. And so you've got a hangover as well of the lockups coming off of those companies. So even if you took the companies that went public in 2020, six months out, the lockup expires, the insiders in those companies who typically own 60, 70, 80% of the company, it takes them years to get out of those names. So I think you've also got a little bit of a hangover with liquidity from existing investors pushing shares into the market. You're starting with a relatively small float on a newly public name where maybe 15 or 20% of it's public. When that goes to 30 or 40% and it's more sellers than buyers, that I think has also been some of the downward pressure on newly public names. That makes sense to me. One last thing, you know, last time we checked in and we had just gotten through Salesforce and Workday and ServiceNow, some earnings that were off cycle. And really there wasn't much to indicate that there was just a pullback in demand from their customers. So I'm just curious if there's anything anecdotal over the last few weeks that you picked up. We're getting into quarter end. We know that Microsoft had that pre-announcement on FX and a lot of people thought that was kind of weird. Just curious your thoughts, at least as far as what we might hear about demand as we get into the end of the quarter, because we might see some pre-announcements early in July before earnings season starts. And the only other thing I'd say about that is in really funky macro environments that we're in right now, yeah, you run the risk if you're overly conservative with your guidance and your commentary of absolutely getting pummeled. But by the same token, until we see some of that capitulation, at least on outlooks, but also on price where now things are set up to beat going forward, sometimes it's hard to bottom. So I'm just curious. I'm of the opinion that the commentary is going to be bad because you have cover for it to be bad, but then guidance is going to like slowly get ratcheted down across the board, even from big cap tech. And that's how we start to come out of this thing at some point, thinking past 2022 numbers and really thinking about 2023. I think that's right. I think you'll see a lot of public companies caution on second half of the year because they don't know what's coming. There's not a lot of upside in guiding high and then missing. And anybody that's in seat-based 
software in particular is looking at the trend in terms of hiring and saying, gosh, if people aren't adding 10, 20% to their workforce or they're declining, then I better not guide more aggressively for the back half of the year. But then they're also setting themselves up for a stronger 2023 because they know that the long-term demand in most of these categories, whether it's cloud infrastructure, low code, no code, even the fintech players who've just gotten absolutely murdered. We haven't talked much about that, but the fintech category has just gotten obliterated. Those markets aren't going away. And particularly when you look at the players, you know, I love some of the players who play outside of the US, companies like Square, Adyen, Delo. Those emerging market economies are still in their infancy in terms of the market opportunity that those players are going after. It's going to take them a while to grow into the TAM and to generate real profits in those markets, but those markets aren't going anywhere. It's interesting that you mentioned some of the fintech. I think I mentioned to you last week that in May, I, I bought a little PayPal. The stock had traded $310 in the summer of 2021 at its highs, and now is trading at 72 bucks. And I look at a company's valuation now is probably cheap, but could get cheaper. And the stock's down today. The stock is down today in a NASDAQ that's up two and a half percent and it's down from where I bought it too. But it's another example where the expectations aren't low enough for a lot of these companies that overshot to the upside on valuation. I want to hit a, a few tweets here. Here was one from Bill Gurley of Benchmark Ventures. I would call him a peer of yours. You'd probably call him the GOAT as it relates to early stage VC investing. But he had a tweet thread. I think it caught a lot of steam last week. And I want to get your take on this. Okay. So it starts out by saying, having survived two previous market resets, 01 and 09, people frequently ask me how 2022 market reset is different and how it's the same. The obvious similarity is the valuation multiples have collapsed. We went from a glass, a very full mindset to one with many concerns. Jeff, give it to me. I know that you liked this thread and you've talked about a lot of these themes with myself and Rick and Guy over the course of this year. Give me your takeaways on this thread in general. I loved it. And I do think Bill clearly is one of the greatest investors of our generation. And I hope to emulate his success. <laughs> I think what was great about it is he encapsulated a bunch of points. One, expecting people to not participate in the run-up and build companies aggressively and quickly and raise capital is silly. They were playing the hand that they were dealt. But the shock of the shift has also caught people by surprise and it's caught their employees by surprise. And so he hits a bunch of sub points that are really important for people to understand. The point that anybody who's of our generation, I would say in their 40s, 50s, who was here for the dot-com bubble, who was here for 08, 09, I was just talking with Ryan Dennehy from Electric, who you know, this morning. And I said, look, the thing we all know is we will come out of this. We are in a very difficult period right now. We need to navigate it. You will come out of it if you're running a company that has capital, has runway, and is well run. The people that take longer to acknowledge the shift in the market, and the analogy that I've been using for folks because it's kind of visually easy to understand is, imagine you were driving a race car at 230 miles an hour for the last five years on a straightaway, and all of a sudden there's a turn. If you keep going 230 miles an hour through that turn, you will fly off the racetrack and you will die. And so you have to adjust course. It's not fun, but you got to adjust course. You got to make that turn. You got to slow down. The best founders started making those changes in December, January, February. Folks are still making those changes today. And there's a lot of folks on Twitter who sort of make fun of Phil's tweets and others. But all he's trying to do and all I've been trying to do and all others are trying to do is say, look, you don't have to put your hand on the stove and learn this the hard way. We've already learned this. Just listen to some of the OGs who've been through a few of these cycles. We can save you a lot of pain and a lot of heartache. I did my unscripted chat with Austin Allred from Bloom Tech the other day. He said to me the other day, he said, Knowing what I know now, I could have built this company in half the time with half the capital. And so, so much of what you're doing as a founder or CEO is learning on the fly. And a lot of what folks are trying to do with social media and elsewhere is just share lessons learned so that we can save folks the time and heartache of learning those lessons painfully. But look, we don't know how long this is going to last. Like you just said, we could be coming into a scenario in the fall where rates are flat or dropping and things are looking better and inflation is going down and people are optimistic about 2023. Or we could be in a more challenging situation. And the only thing you can do as a CEO, make sure you're running a well-run company. Make sure you've got plenty of capital. Hopefully, you've got good board members around you to give you honest and objective advice. Another fun conversation I had with a CEO the other day, a CEO of a private company. I was telling him about a public company that's trading at about three and a half times ARR. And he said, well, man, I'm glad I'm not in their shoes. And I said, you are. You just don't know it. <laughs> the public market gets weighed every day. And in the private markets, we tend to think people only have to weigh themselves once a year or every 18 months when they pop their heads up to raise money. But I think what everybody's realizing and what we all have realized is 
how quickly those public market valuations impact private market valuations than they have. And they're coming all the way down to series A and seed. But again, as a founder, I started my first company in 97 and I lived through the dot-com bubble. It was brutal. And then I started my second company in 2003. There isn't a minute I look back and say, gosh, I wish I'd raised money at a different price. Like you move on, you build your company, you live the rest of your life and we will power through this. The other tweet Bill had was talking about some of the epic companies that came out of 08, 09. Snapchat, Square, Stripe, Meta, who you mentioned, Twilio, all these companies that were founded in that generation, we're going to see the same thing happen again here. There are going to be some really great companies that get built out of here. It's just a humbling time for investors, and it's a humbling time for founders to have to do the reset. Yeah. Well, talk to me about that, because if you think about a lot of really genius people who worked at some of these huge incumbents, and now you see the stocks get cut in half, and maybe their options are underwater, and maybe they start laying people off, and just the vibe changes, right? It's just a thing that happens in downturns. There's going to be some exceptional people leaving these places to solve big problems. And so talk to me a little bit about the mindset of an investor like you. You guys go from early stage to much later stage sort of stuff. I mean, Bill also had a tweet about dating back to 08. Somebody quote tweeted something that he had written and just saying that while a lot of their peers were cowering, Benchmark was open for business. And he's like, we're still open for business. So can I ask you, does it just have to do with valuation at this point? You're still looking to back great founders who are looking to solve big problems. How early do you feel like we are in that sort of reset where you, you as an investor want to reevaluate your strategy given the change in the macro environment? Yeah. And it was Eric Vistria, who's a partner at Benchmark, who tweeted out and mentioned Twitter 2009, Instagram 2011, Uber 2011, WeWork 2012, Elastic 2012, Snapchat 2013. So we're not making this up when we say that there were some epic companies built in the immediate period after the GFC. I think we're still in the second or third inning of the reset, of the valuation reset. And so we have to sort of get to the point where some of the companies that we really want to be investors in, and we have any given time, we're tracking call it 50 to 100 companies in the US alone. We're meeting several thousand per year. We're narrowing that down to a list of 50 to 100 that we really want to be investors in. And then you're just trying to get alignment between at what price would I want to be an investor in that company? And can I reasonably forecast out the kind of venture type returns that we want to see, which we always think of as like 10X or more, from that valuation. And if the founder is still at 1.2 billion on 10 million of ARR, I may have a hard time getting there on that map. But if that founder six months later is coming in and saying, gosh, Jeff, we've really enjoyed building the relationship with you for the last two years. We love the fact that you guys know our category. You've got a bunch of relevant investments in our space. At what valuation would it make sense for you to invest? Because I'm open and I'm considering taking in new capital. And so then we'll get into a, a rational conversation about where it makes sense. And and we are absolutely telling our team, guys, we are going to make some of the best investments in the next five years in the next six to nine months, because we have companies we've been tracking who are going to want capital and they're going to want investors that are rational, long-term players. And we think we fit that profile. And I think back to your point, the industry has changed a lot. When I got into venture capital in 2008, you had early stage, you had growth stage, and then you had crossover. Today, what you see with most of the larger funds where it's Sequoia, Andreessen, GGV, Bessemer, et cetera. We have a $650 million fund dedicated just for seed and A. So valuations below 100, we've got $650 million to invest with those folks. And then another 1.8 billion to invest in series A through IPO. The theory there being, if we meet a great founding team in a category we love, we want to be able to put capital to work in that company throughout the life of that company. And so if you look at a company like HashiCorp, which went public last year, we first invested in the series A and invested in multiple rounds for that company. And that's most venture capital investors have adopted that model, and I think it's a really good one to maintain ownership and put more of our LP capital to work into companies where we have a bit of an unfair advantage, right? We're on the board. We know the company. We know the teams that tend to have capacity to exceed their forecasts, which then I think back to your point about looking at both public and private markets also gives us a little bit of an advantage when a company does go public because we know the companies and the teams that tend to underpromise and overdeliver. And you see that today. I mean, one of Bill's tweets, he also said, listen to this podcast with Frank Slootman. You want to go toe to toe with Frank Slootman? He doesn't care about the macro. That guy's one of the hardest charging people in tech, and he is going to be powering through the growth of Snowflake. And that's why one of the reasons I think you want to be a shareholder of Snowflake. So let me ask you about this. You've talked about Slootman and I've heard him speak and he's just revered by the investment community, both public and private. And so my question to you is that 
who was it on? Was it on the company? Was it on their expectations? I mean, at its highs, Snowflake, which is not profitable on a gap basis, was trading at north of like 50 times sales in the public markets, right? So here's a company that's going to do, I don't know, like 2 billion this year, 3 billion next. So you can think about 4 billion the year after that. These are, I'm just looking at consensus estimates here and it still trades at 19 times sales this year. And again, unprofitable. So, well, let me ask you a question. The guidance that they've officially given is for fiscal year 29, which again is seven years out, revenue guide of 10 billion. So the one of the fastest growing companies in history, which it already, it is the fastest growing software company in history, but they've guided to 10 billion in fiscal year 29. So if it trades at 19 times this year, what is it trading at? And are you willing to hold the stock for that period of time? Or do you have other things you want to go own? I think that's the question. Is there something else I'd rather own? For example, you know, I love Blackstone. I bought some more Blackstone down at $90 a share. Why? It's paying a 6% dividend. I want to own both of those because they're giving me sort of two ends of the spectrum. But I think that's the question. When you look at the reason people have traded out of Snowflake, I don't think it's because they doubt the long-term prospects of the company. I think it's just that they're saying, gosh, it looks expensive versus something else I could go own in the market today, whether it's, I don't know what it is. What is it? Shake Shack, United Airlines? What are they buying? But that sounds like an eternity, 2029. I mean, Slootman, let's be frank, won't be there any longer and he won't be on the hook for that long-term guidance. And the company, even five years out, is expected on a gap basis not to be profitable. So you tell me, are those 70% gross margins going up or down between now and then? And I guess these are the things that I like. People maybe look at me and say, okay, well, you're just glass half empty. I look at it and say, okay, well, here's a stock that's down 65% of the year. It's down a lot more from its highs. I don't blame the company. Company. I mean, they put out guidance and it's not like it's Elon Musk guiding to this stuff. I mean, he's obviously demonstrated during different market cycles on many different companies. So he deserves all the trust you're willing to give him. But again, this is not on the company that it trades at 20 times sales down 75% from its all time highs. To me, maybe it's a combination of some bankers and some VCs and who knows? You know what I'm saying? The market changed, right? I mean, the weather changed. We were sitting on the beach, 90 degrees out, and everybody was putting on suntan lotion. It went from 90 degrees to 45 degrees. I don't think as a public company CEO, you can shift on a dime based on the way the market views your company. And so to your point, this is a company that has been built, and there are a bunch of these companies. A lot of the high growth tech companies that are growing, a lot of the cloud and software names that are growing at a faster clip than we've ever seen companies grow at in history. As you know, companies used to go public and their growth rate slowed down. What's been happening in the last few years is companies have been accelerating. And a lot of those companies have been built in an era where you were incentivized to grow as fast as you could and take as much market share as you can. What I think is a really good question is, have we permanently moved away from that? Or is this just a blip and we're going to go back to a mode where people say, no, gosh, I want those big TAM high growth rate companies because I believe the long-term margins and cash flow are going to be really strong? Or have we just gone into a five-year bear market for tech? I think it's the former. I think we will go back to a market where people do want to own these names. I just don't know what point in time that's going to be because right now they're moving their dollars and their capital into less risky assets. And I don't blame them. To me, I think it's a little both. So really, what's really changed is the inflation equation, which also means interest rates, which, you know, cost of capital and the amount of money that was flowing into VC out the risk curve, if you will, by some traditional asset pools. I mean, that's had a lot to do with it, too. So I really do think that a lot of what we learn about how sovereigns deal with all of this debt with a period of very low interest rates and really a series of black swan events, which have exasperated a lot of this sort of stuff. I mean, a lot of people weren't modeling in a global pandemic and what another round of quantitative easing would mean for risk assets. So again, that's all going to work itself out. And a really interesting question is what happens if Russia doesn't attack Ukraine? I mean, that was a Molotov cocktail on the cake. Now we had a bunch of layers to the cake that were already built with supply chain constraints, labor constraints, and rising inflation. But I think the Russia attacking Ukraine, increasing fuel prices, it's going to have an impact on food. Those have been significant. But just going back to the point about what is in favor and what's out of favor, I love this because it's such a stark narrative. There's no one on the planet who can make the argument that the upside for IBM over the next five years is greater than Snowflake. And yet, if you look at IBM stock has gone nowhere for a decade. It, it has a, been a terrible stock to own. And yet, IBM is up 1.3% on the year and Snowflake's down, what is it, down 40, 50%? 
that tells you everything you know right now. People have shifted out of high growth, high risk assets. They've shifted into things that look safe, but don't have any upside. IBM is not going to give you any upside over the next five to 10 years. I just don't know how you could make the bull case for IBM. They're nowhere on innovation. Their marketing is complete BS. And so we will see a phase where people will start to feel like these valuations are rational for tech. One of the other challenges, you know, right now, a lot of major tech hedge funds are down. They're down big. The big folks that were moving a lot of the markets in tech were hedge funds. Those funds were down last year. They lagged the S&P last year, and they're down this year. And so as you've got existing investors moving out of recent IPOs, there isn't a real strong buyer base other than maybe your big mutual funds like T. Rowe and Fidelity. And so until those tech hedge funds get off their heels and can start to be a buyer of tech again, I think it's going to be a little rough sailing. Well, listen, they're going to do things differently. Tiger Global being down 52% off of peak assets, that changes the behavior, a lot of those asset pools going forward and a lot of the strategies. And that's just something we learned after the financial crisis. And that is not a one or two quarter fix. Last thing, maybe this will be a little more fun. Dan Loeb of Third Point, he is a used to be an activist, but a prolific public markets investor. I know they do plenty of stuff in privates too, but he tweeted this the other day. And I think you and I both kind of appreciated this. Maybe it has something to do with the gray hair we have. But he said, I think we are about to hear a change in the sneering of OK Boomer to reflect a change of meaning from you're too old to understand. I'm too busy to explain it to you out of respect. OK, Boomer, thank you for sharing your wisdom. I had no idea issuing stock should be treated like an expense and appreciate your movie recommendations, especially Enter the Dragon and Godfather 1 and 2. <laughs> Give me your take on that because it's really kind of funny. We were wearing that OK, Boomer thing as the badge of honor, and we are certainly not boomers, but we would hear stuff like that, and they just did not want to hear our movie recommendations. What's up with that? The good news is most people appreciate classic rock. I find even the younger generation appreciates Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith. One of the things that I was having a conversation with one of our LPs when COVID hit in February, March of 2020, and I I said to her, I said, you know, it's at moments like this where I really value the experience in our firm. We have people who've been through several market cycles, the ups, the downs, and that ability to remain calm when the shit hits the fan there's almost no other way to learn it than from experience. And so I I think he obviously was being snarky and probably alluding to some of the things that have gone on in crypto and elsewhere. But I do think in moments when the seas get choppy, people value experience. And I have certainly seen a lot of wisdom dispensed from around the boardroom. And it tends to be coming from people who've been through a few cycles, right? And a lot of advice to founders to remain calm, to raise capital early, to reduce heads sooner rather than later. I just think in moments like this, we all value experience. I thought it was funny. And we've been in an era where the world sort of lost its mind on on low rates for the last five years. And we're probably going back to a mode where we will be in a much more rational environment. But some people have a really hard time digesting that. I mean, Gurley's tweet made that point as well. You could ignore it. You can ignore it. You can ignore it until finally you wake up and realize that you're sitting on the beach and it's 40 degrees out. The environment has changed and it's just hard to acknowledge it unless you've been through a few of them. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I would just say the analog to public markets is not too different. For all of those years with unusually low rates after the financial crisis, there were fits and starts. There were periods where global growth was waning here and this central bank was going to do that and this outbreak over here. I mean, a lot of the similar stuff that all got mushed together over the last couple of years. But you know what the kids were saying, BTFD, buy the fucking dip, right? And it worked until it didn't. And then it worked again during COVID. I don't know if you saw this Bill Maher thing from the other night. He was kind of mansplaining this woman on his show when she said the market crashed during COVID. And he's like, the market didn't crash. What's really funny is the stock market sold off the fastest it had ever dropped 35% from an all-time high, but he missed it. And I'm not blaming him because it only lasted for a few months. You know why? Because the Fed threw trillions of dollars at it. The Treasury threw trillions of dollars at it. Risk assets just ballooned and it didn't feel like anything. Take the COVID blip from February to April out of the S&P chart and it looks bottom left, upper right, 45 degrees. So to me, I think that that mentality is gone. That's out. And so I think the one thing that I keep saying, what's similar going back to past cycles of the financial crisis and the dot-com, when the NASDAQ corrected 80-some percent from its all-time highs in March of 2000 to its lows in 02, it didn't make a new high for a decade. 
And so the idea that it's all going to be like what we saw in early 2020 or any of those times you BTFD'd since the financial crisis, that's probably what's different. So it's going to take a different mindset. It's going to take a different level of patience. It's going to take maybe even a different return environment, like you're kind of resetting your own returns. So some of those venture returns might look really different with rates where they are and access to capital, what it is. I just want to add one thing to that. I mean, look at the returns. S&P 500 was up 18.4% in 2020, 31% in 2019, down 4% in 18, up 21% in 17. I grew up in an era where a 5 to 10% up year was considered exceptional. And so we just were in a very interesting time period. I mean, the reason hedge funds were created back in the day was people wanted to outperform the 5 to 10% return. It's been tough for them the last few years because the S&P and the NASDAQ were ripping on their own. But I, I just think we're going to be into a little bit more normal environment. It's probably going to be a better stock picker's environment. You actually have to do some work and find companies that can outperform. And we certainly are bullish in terms of our investment strategy for the next 12 months. I think everybody's been humbled. I mean, the smartest investors in the world who should have seen we were at the top were buying. Everybody's been humbled. And so we've all been reminded that the market is efficient and rates do matter. I think some of this was unprecedented. I mean, did we all see COVID creating a labor shortage and a supply chain shortage and the geopolitical issues, Russia, Ukraine? Man, that would have been hard to forecast, that Molotov cocktail all coming together over the last 18 months. So we've got to play through it. I think the most important message for founders who listen to your podcast is don't let all that distract you. Go build a great company. And if you do that, the rest will take care of itself. And that's the beauty of conversations like these. If I'm a talented builder, go build. The macro environment shouldn't really matter that much. I mean, the cost of the capital is actually the big differentiator. And I'll just say this about S&P returns, which you just mentioned. In 2020, when the market crashed and we we're in the middle of a global pandemic, the stock market didn't close it down. If you want to take it back to the inflating of the tech bubble, in 1995, the S&P was up 37%. 96, it was up 23%. In 1997, it was up 33%. In 98, 28%. In 99, 21%. So during those periods, we had long-term capital. We had an Asia crisis. We had a Russian sovereign. It was not an easy trip. Everybody knew that was an insane period of returns, but it got corrected. 2000 was down about 10%. 2001, down about 12%. NASDAQ down much more. And 2002, down 22%. The third year of that bear market was the gut punch. And then we had these sorts of returns. We had a ricochet in 03, up 29%. But then the returns were kind of not great. 04, 05, 06, and 07. They were between five and let's call it, I don't know, 15% or so. So, and then obviously the financial crisis. So, when you th just think about some of those returns, we pulled forward a lot of return where rates were and the access to capital and just kind of the YOLO investment environment. I'll just leave you with that, Jeff. No, I think it's important context. A lot of people weren't here for that. I'm a little more optimistic just because. We had like 250 million internet users in the world in 2000. The, the market opportunities that tech companies were going after were a fraction of what they are today. And so the optimist in me says that this will be shorter lived because the market opportunities are so big and they're global in nature. And even if you look at categories like fintech where the penetration is so low, I think 23, 24, 25 are going to be very exciting years. I don't know how the market's going to value those companies. The best thing you can do as a founder or CEO just go execute. Eventually, value gets created. I mean, there are so many moments in time where Amazon, Microsoft, Google, people doubted the future of those companies and their trillion-dollar companies. It does work itself out over time, but it could be a rough year. Well, hopefully you'll continue to come back for the tequila. I mean, you'll continue to come back for the conversation here, man. I learn every single time. So thank you, Jeff, for joining us on OK Computer. I appreciate it, bud. Thanks for having me, man. All right, stick around. We have Katie Stan and Alex Redder from moxie ventures hey dan what up guy you're into this fintech what's all this i'm hearing about current you're gonna like this guy current is a fintech company that's completely disrupting traditional banking wait a second does that mean i don't have to drive to the bank anymore <laughs> yeah exactly i'm a new current customer and i manage all of my finances from one easy to use app well i gotta get this app but where can i learn more it's super easy. Just go to current.com slash OK, O-K-A-Y, and download the app. That's current.com slash OK. 
Current is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by and Visa debit card issued by Choice Financial Group, member FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA, Inc., and can be used everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. Hey, it's Dan here. I'm excited to tell you about a $1 billion app that's disrupting the way people like you and me invest. It's called Masterworks. They offer investors access to an estimated $1.7 trillion alternative asset that was once only accessible by the ultra-wealthy. I'm talking about blue chip art. Blue chip art has seen price appreciation that's outpaced the S&P 500 by 164% from 1995 to 2021. And the Wall Street Journal recently called it among the hottest markets on earth. It's no wonder the ultra rich like Jeff Bezos recently sold tons of Amazon stock and bought more art. And now you can too with the art investment app called masterworks.io. Join over 300,000 members for free on masterworks.io. Just go to masterworks.art slash OK Computer, O-K-A-Y. That's masterworks.art slash OK Computer. See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Taboola uses AI to power recommendations for many of the world's top publishers and cell phone manufacturers. You know Taboola if you ever went to websites like CNBC or USA Today. When you finish reading an article, it's that tricked out recommendation engine pointing you towards additional content you will like. They also help brands reach over 500 million daily users, which makes them a compelling alternative to Facebook and Google ad platforms. Taboola has long-term exclusive partnerships with publishers, which means they help people like you and me discover content outside of social media. Taboola is a founder-led company that is traded as TBLA on the NASDAQ. Find out more about their mission at taboola.com. Okay, and we're back. Okay, computer, I'm here with Katie Stanton. You guys know Katie. She is a co-host of this fine podcast and her partner, Alex Redder of Moxie Ventures. He is a returning guest. How are you guys? We're great. Thanks for having us. Hey, Dan. Thanks for having us. We were supposed to do this IRL, as the kids say here, in Boulder this past weekend, and I was unable to make it. But Katie, you tweeted something I thought was really interesting. You said you fulfilled your final requirement towards Boulder residency. What did you do this past weekend, Katie? Yeah, well, thanks to you. I went to my very first dead show and it felt like the best place to go in Boulder, Colorado. And I got to go with your brother and your two sisters. It was the best thing ever. And Alex, you're actually a proper dead fan, aren't you? And you didn't make it in your hometown of Folsom? I didn't make it this time. I've been to that show at Folsom Field before. It's super fun. I was leaving town for 10 days and it kind of all went to pieces with family logistics stuff. But I can hear the show from my house, so that's cool, too. It's kind of the mecca for, I guess, hippies, when you say there, Katie. And the picture that you tweeted out with Bob Weir in all of his glory with the flat irons behind it, the Folsom Field is pretty amazing. I'm kind of bummed I missed it. Well, let's get to it, people, because, A, I want to definitely hear what's going on with the Moxie portfolio and just talk a little bit about the macro. And I know that you guys are generally early stage. And I think some of the things that some of your peers in VC are focused on right now as it relates to the macro are probably more sensitive to their portfolios than some of the things that you guys are thinking about, invested in, advising companies on. But it's definitely something that I think needs to be on everyone's radar here, you know, as far as how quickly things are moving as it relates to the economy here. But first things first, Katie, I saw a headline last week. I think I kind of knew about it. It was on the DL a little bit, but you joined Yahoo's board. Now, a lot of people, and I made a joke on Twitter, maybe it wasn't great or not. I said it was dusting off my Yahoo finance message board avatar or whatever from the late 90s. And I think that people new to this environment forget what a behemoth Yahoo was in the late 90s. It was literally like the Apple computer of that period in a way as it relates to tech stocks and being a poster child for it. So you had said on the very first pod that we did last fall that Yahoo Finance was one of your first jobs out of college. And it was one of the first jobs you actually loved. Talk to me about coming full circle, joining this board. It was just bought by Apollo out of Verizon Media. Tell us a little bit about this because it's kind of amazing sort of, I'm not going to call it a bookend, but it seems like the new start of a journey with Yahoo Finance. Yeah, I'm super honored and really excited by it. So as you know, I've been actually a banker in New York, which was miserable and I hated it. And I remember I was working on a trading floor. I had Bloomberg at my disposal and was like, God, I got to get out of this job. And I did a search on Yahoo. And this is in 1999. And Yahoo had just started putting out a flicker of 
stock content. So just like some stock quotes and a bunch of other pieces of information. And I thought, oh man, how cool would it be to work at a company like Yahoo, something even called Yahoo. And all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, I understand a little bit about financial markets. And what if I could take all the content at my disposal with my Bloomberg terminal and make that more accessible to retail investors and started this whole process of pitching Yahoo why they should hire someone like me. And they were just kind of like, all right, lady, whatever. And that became my path in Silicon Valley. And so we moved out to California and it really was the first job I ever loved. It taught me you could love your job, surrounded by all these smart, ambitious, optimistic, talented people. It was really the beginning of so much of the internet today. And it taught me I could love all these things I was doing. So anyway, fast forward to last, I think it was November, December, Jim Lanzone, who becomes the CEO of the now private Yahoo owned by Apollo, reached out and he was like, hey, any chance you want to join me on this new journey and the board? I was like, okay, I am way too busy. And the last thing I need to do is join a board. But I love Yahoo and I love Jim. I think Jim is a phenomenal leader. I worked with Jim way back because after Yahoo went to Google and Jim was one of our customers at Ask G's and he was such a pain in the ass. He asked so many hard questions that we never knew the answers to. And I remember thinking at that time, I never want to be on the opposite side of the table as Jim Lanzone. I want to be on the same team as Jim Lanzone because that guy is smart. He's awesome. And he knows how to build and he knows how to scale and he knows how to reimagine. So I felt like I just had to do this. I just had to make time. And now that my kids are all gone to college and they don't need me as much. I'm like, well, this can be my new special project. It's been great. Well, that's a good segue here. Alex, you know, you were on OK Computer in late April. You also came on CNBC's Fast Money with me. And we were talking about at the time, Elon Musk in his bid to take Twitter private. And again, I remind our listeners that you were the head of engineering over the last, I don't know, you left Twitter in 2016, but you had hired the now or existing CEO, Prague Agarwal. And you made a very, I think you made a great case of why he's the guy to run that company and fix that company and why Elon Musk, while he's probably got a lot of great ideas, they seem to be really kind of focused in a way that the company is not currently positioned to take on. And I'm just curious, like how your thought process has evolved. You also made a really good case as talented as Elon Musk is. If he were to kind of focus his energy on some other big problems, it might be a better use of his time. I'm just curious, you and I really haven't checked in since then. How are you thinking about this and how it's playing out right now? Yeah, so much has happened since then. feels like we talked three years ago, even though it was probably a couple of months ago. So maybe a good place to start is I watched his all hands with the employees the other day. And it was interesting. I was describing this to a friend of mine who also is a former executive at Twitter. And the way I put it was, it was like asking a bunch of freshman Harvard students some big philosophical question like, hey, what's the role of government in a modern society? Elon is very smart. You know, freshman Harvard students are very smart. You get smart thoughts back, but they're naive and very general and not actionable. And the thoughts, while not wrong, don't have the benefit of having read either all philosophers throughout history or having understood the last 15 years of what the company has actually been doing and trying and what they learned from every experiment. So he's a brilliant guy, obviously, and extremely accomplished, but I found it to be very simple thinking. And I mean, the good news is he's a fast learner. So if anyone is going to ramp up and progress from philosophy 101 to philosophy 201, 301, it's him. But I just don't see a coherent plan that is specific enough to make a difference. Like, yes, of course, it would be great if Twitter was as successful as WeChat. However, like one, people have thought about that, or yes, we should be as successful as massive companies. Two, there are a ton of structural differences between WeChat and Twitter, not the least of which are the support that you get from the government in the country where you're primarily operating. So how these general things like that, oh, one thing you mentioned, we should have free speech, but also protect people so they feel safe because if they don't feel safe, they won't use the platform. That's all very true. I didn't hear anything that made me think this is going to translate into some magic roadmap that is going to transform the future of the company. So we'll see. Well, it's funny, since then, over the last few weeks, he's been hedgy about under what circumstances he would 
buy the company that he's actually already committed to buying through an agreement that is backed. He's talked about, you know, different levels of equity funding and securing the debt funding from banks. And he goes back and forth about this bot issue, which he had all the time in the world to kind of look into before he closed his agreement to buy them. I do think it's interesting that this morning on Tuesday, he was speaking at some conference that was in Cotter and he was doing it by Zoom or whatever. And he said, ideally, I'd like to get 80% of North American and perhaps I don't know, half the world or something ultimately on Twitter in one form or another. When you hear stuff like that, Alex, again, you were the head of engineering at this company during a hyper growth phase, right? You guys probably went from the time that you got there to the time that you left from whatever your first, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 million users to north of 100 million or something like that. But the fact that the company or the platform has plateaued in whatever you want to call it, daily monetizable users, somewhere between like 200 and 300 million, it doesn't really lend itself to the sort of hyper growth, no matter what the tweaks are, to get to a billion. I mean, we know that Facebook Meta has, what, two, three billion monthly active users. We know that Google Alphabet has multiple platforms with at least a billion users on them. What is the likelihood that you would ever get more than 50% of North America or a billion users on this platform? So typically, I think it's very low. I mean, when you look at these growths, usually there is high percentage year-over-year growth in the early stages and things plateau. And if you're extremely lucky, you plateau above a billion users. But after re-accelerating growth, changing the second derivative of your user graph, I think is very, very unlikely. It's not impossible. And there are stories of companies that have been either left for dead or left for some moderate size thing, re-accelerating and reinventing themselves. But I think it's pretty hard. I think, and we talked about this before, I think the biggest disservice to Twitter has been the comparison of Twitter to Facebook, people don't realize what a massive outlier Facebook is. We used to talk about what are all the billion user clubs in the world. And honestly, other than Facebook, they're all nationalities and religions. It's like Instagram users and Catholics and citizens of China and Facebook users. It's not this thing that any company that has a good idea will get a billion users. That's just this massive bar. And unfortunately, Twitter's always been compared to that. And almost no companies are that size. And I think that really hurts them. And I think it gets in their head. And yes, I mean, I agree with you, Elon. It would be great if half the world used Twitter. But I don't see any new information that makes that believable, that that could happen. Brings me back to Katie's conversation about the opportunity that Yahoo has. So it was lifted out of Verizon Media. It's taking private here and it's able to be retooled without being in the public eye for all intents and purposes. And they almost have the opposite situation where they have this huge user base. They have a great brand. There is brand affinity and the ability to kind of retool it to better monetize the users that you do have. That's the opportunity. If you take something private, the whole idea is to take it back out public when you've made it a much better business. It doesn't have to be a much bigger business. It just has to be a better business, in my opinion. When you think about what Elon wants to do by taking on debt, by leveraging his own equity holdings in Tesla that seem to be going down pretty quickly at a clip, there's a lot of risk to just like, you wouldn't take Twitter private with the intent of taking it back out public a couple years later for just a double. And when you think about the valuations in this space based on per user, per employee, whatever metric you want to look at, it's really hard to think about at the price that he's paying for Twitter to get much more than a double. And I'll just remind you that Snap at its recent all-time highs was probably north of 70, $80 billion enterprise value. And this is a company that has a similar revenue base. So to me, a lot of things have to go right for this to be a successful transaction for me. I don't actually think it happens. Let's segue a little bit because he mentioned in a lot of these discussions about turning Twitter into a super app. And I think it's interesting that founder of Snap, Evan Spiegel, is in, I guess he's in Khan. I'm surprised, Katie, why are you not in Khan? That seems like so, like such in your wheelhouse. It's a great question. I really should be there. Right? So he endorsed Elon's plan. I, you know, He wants to make it a super app. He wants to think about WeChat or something like that. And I'm just curious, from your time at Twitter here, is it just way too aspirational when you think about, and Alex makes a great point. You don't need to compare this to Facebook. Facebook has lots of different levers to pull to kind of keep your attention. They just need to do a couple things really well. And when I think about Snap and I think about what Spiegel endorsing Musk view as a super app, sales 
sounds like he's got lots of levers to pull. And you think about the demographic they have and the way that this demographic engages with this app and how they use it. It seems like there could be payments. There's just tons of content that can be monetized on that. I'm just curious, was that something that you guys gave a whole heck of a lot of thought to back in the day? Or were you just trying to build the user base and build the utility that will keep people coming back to it? Well, first of all, I do think Evan is brilliant and he's creative and Snap is very successful. But Evan Spiegel isn't even on Twitter. So I think him talking about Twitter being a super app is kind of silly. And second of all, I mean, in terms of, I don't even know what Elon means by Twitter being a super app, but I think Twitter is doing the best that it can be. And I think my personal take is let the company build the product in the way that they see fit. These are people that have chosen to work there, dedicate their portion of their lives and their career building something that they believe in. And it's such a mission-driven, a really talented employee base with awesome leadership. I mean, they've got great leaders in place. Like, leave them alone <laughs> and electrify our homes and our houses. Like we need more of that. Climate change is our biggest challenge, our biggest opportunity. I would love to see you know the brilliant minds in tech world focus there. Alex, you made that case really well when we talked about this in late April. I just say this as somebody who's watched public markets and these sorts of spats kind of blow up, if you will, and it could be an activist investor. It could be a really hostile sort of takeover situation. I mean, throw it all in there. And then you throw in the fact that Elon is not only the richest man in the world, he's for some reason perceived to be like the smartest man on this planet or maybe in the universe for that matter. But he's also destroyed the culture of this company. There's no way that this existing board and this existing management team survives, obviously, if he buys the company, but if he doesn't buy the company, they're toast. It's over. And so all of what you guys have had to say about some of these people that you know very well, who've been working really hard to push this culture and this product forward, it's done. I'm just telling you, however it shakes out, and so to me, I think the company has two options right now. They can either negotiate for a lower price and try to make nice with Elon and keep intact everything that they have, or they basically have to find what looks to be a white knight. And again, I would actually say this company right now has a $30 billion enterprise value, which would be higher if they were forced to close at that 5420 evaluation, which places it near 44 billion. Right now, Snap, has a $20 billion enterprise value. I'd merge these two things and have Evan run it, have Brett Taylor be the chairman. I'd bring you guys back, our friend out of Bain. No, thanks. <laughs> Respectfully declined. I know, no thanks. That's a really sad state of affairs. This management team and this board and some of the best people there, they're gone, no matter what happens. I don't think the culture is destroyed. I think what's remarkable about Twitter, both as a product and a company, is that it's the most resilient product and company I've ever seen. It can't be destroyed. And I think the team, they just remain heads down and determined. And this is just a mega distraction. And we'll see at the end of the day if it goes through. I, I kind of believe you too. Like, I don't know if it goes through and then they can go through their next chapter. But it's like, there's no accountability. Here's somebody who's very rich and very powerful saying, yeah, I'm going to buy this. And maybe I'm not and going back and forth and the public markets have to respond. And there's no accountability. Even if he decides not to do this, he gets away with it. it that's the annoying part to me. So I've talked to a bunch of, not directly to any of the bankers, but a bunch of people who have talked to the bankers. And hearing that perspective makes me actually think the deal is more likely to go through than what I think otherwise, which is I'm kind of growing increasingly pessimistic. Basically, they say behind the scenes, all the people in suits are just doing the things and it actually looks like a normal deal process. And none of these tweets or random announcements or contradictions actually have any standing in the actual process, which I think that's kind of interesting. So there's a chance maybe it actually looks under the hood like a more normal plotting m and process that just happens. And the other thing that I've heard is short of the whole deal falling apart and inking a new deal, there isn't really a mechanism to reprice this thing. You go buy a house and you have a mortgage contingency and an inspection contingency, but you don't have random other contingencies if you decide you don't like the color of the walls or whatever, that they have to change that for you. And so maybe it is about the price and it falls apart and they have to redo a deal. But from what I've heard from the bankers, there's not really a mechanism to do that. So we'll see. Maybe it has to blow up to get redone or maybe it doesn't get done at all. I'm not sure. I think blowing up is probably going to be really important. Over the next few weeks, the company is either going to make a decision to pre-announce a quarter, a quarter that Snap had already pre-announced, and it's not likely to be good. And listen, you guys could 
put on a strong face for some of your old friends and they say, well, they're just grinding away. They're working hard. There is no way when your company and your culture are being attacked that the way that this guy is doing, and this is probably a guy that people at Twitter had looked up to at one point, and I'm not asking you guys to comment on it. I find his alt-right turn very disturbing. That's must. So I suspect that the quarter is a disaster. The guidance is going to be a disaster. And he's looking for every opportunity to recut this deal. I think he probably wants to buy it, but at a price. And aside from that, then he just draws it out and he continues to do what he's doing. So I feel bad because I think they're screwed no matter which way it goes at this point. But more importantly, we started this conversation by talking about you guys being in Boulder. You're running Moxie Ventures, you guys. I think some of our listeners are very familiar. You're early stage and energy tech, health tech, some things that you're really trying to be constructive and investing in some really early things. Love to hear a little bit about what's going on because if you're on one of these coasts, if you're on the East Coast, you're obsessed with the stock market crash. If you're on the West Coast, you're obsessed with this Web3 crypto Silicon Valley reckoning, if you will. And again, I'm not saying that this is like lights out, we're like 2000 times, but this is really what's got most people's attention on in the middle of this country where you guys are, again, focused on builders and early stage entrepreneurs in areas that you think are really important as it relates to tech. I'm just curious, what's the vibe out there? And are you giving the Heisman to some of the stuff on the coast? Yeah. So just to recap, Moxie is an early stage venture fund. We invest in software solutions to hard problems that help a lot of people. And so we're generalist investors, but the three categories that we tend to gravitate towards are climate tech, health tech, and fintech. And while the markets are super erratic in every asset class, and especially later stage, the nice thing about being in seed where there's a lot of risk, you're usually at the beginning of the journey, right? So this is actually a great time for early stage investors like us to come in and back really smart founders and again, starting like or solving really hard problems. And so it's almost an evergreen opportunity for us at the early stage. And while there's a lot of panic in the world and also in venture, I think for us, we're pretty calm. We're evaluating, we're reassessing, we're trying to support our portfolio, and we still are actively investing. And someone had asked us, like, oh, are you going to take the summer off? We're like, is that an option? Like, no. It seems so funny, right? Because over the past few years where prices were so high, people couldn't invest fast enough. And then all of a sudden prices are low. We're like, oh, I'm I'm taking the summer off. We do think that this is a really good opportunity. And what we're doing to our existing portfolio companies, that we're encouraging them to just be prepared, making sure that you have 18 to 24 months of runway, doing whatever it takes to survive and make sure you do these things quickly. And some of these things may be just cutting costs, conserving your cash, adding more runway or top off to what you have, considering other alternative types of investments or capital if it's venture debt. For some companies, it could be getting grants. We talked to one company today that told their employee base what was going on, and they all needed to figure out something really clever. And so almost the entire company decided to just pull down their salaries a bit. And so they wouldn't have to lay anybody off. And we thought that was a really clever way to think through this next chapter. So we remain like, yes, things are, you know, you have to be really careful, but we think it's still a good time to invest and we're, we're pretty positive. We're not PE investors, late stage private investors looking at a massive spreadsheet and figuring out multiples. Obviously that matters for the long-term exit, but we're really looking at exceptional founders tackling meaningful problems in large markets and wanting to build enduring companies. Over the long term, once they do that, if the multiple is above historic averages or is closer to the historic average, that of course affects our math ultimately. But it doesn't affect the decisions we make right now around finding awesome founders in big problems. So we look, this is why we look at those problems, fintech, health tech, climate tech, and other things. But those are areas specifically where they're massive problems. They're not going away. The problems are not less important just because of what the public market is doing. And one very encouraging trend is we see so many exceptional founders and entrepreneurs and engineers and salespeople running into these really meaningful things. And we're here to support them. One of the things that you see in really difficult times and periods of adversity, it doesn't change who people are, it just reveals it, right? And so it's revealing who are the best founders who are in it for the right reasons. And so especially with a lot of these very important global challenges, climate change, access to healthcare, these are recession proof. The planet is burning. I don't know what percentage of the globe today has extreme heat, but it's very, very high. We're in Colorado. We've had three fires in the past year and a half, and 
the last one was in December. I mean, a wildfire in Colorado in December, that's not normal. So we need to do a better job and have enough of these really talented founders step up and meet the moment and find investors to back them. And so it's one of the reasons why we're we're actually excited about this next period of time, because the right founders are really stepping up to meet the moment and the tourists are leaving. Well, talk to me a little bit about climate tech. We've collectively talked about it here. It's not an area that I know a whole heck of a lot about, but when I think about some of the major inputs that are causing all of these palpitations in the global economy and thus also in financial markets, inflationary pressure from energy is one of the biggest drivers here. And I have to think that, you know, in times like this, it just kind of makes it more evident that there needs to be more investment. And I'd also say this, when Joe Biden was running for office, they were pounding on fossil fuel industry and ESG was doing what it was doing. And it just seemed to be like the Dems were moving to one thing. And I'm not trying to make this political, but right now we have Joe Biden preparing for a trip to go see MBS in Saudi Arabia. We have Elon Musk tweeted a couple months ago that we need to be drilling for more oil. I mean, it seems like the whole world has been turned upside down on this issue. I'm just curious how you guys are thinking about it. And it must be a really unique time to invest in solutions for consistent solutions based on technology for decades to come in the space. I think it's a long-term versus a short-term issue. It's hard if you're the president, to pick that example, and you see gas going from whatever it was historically, two or three bucks a gallon, up to over five, I think on average it was in the United States maybe last week, that really affects people's checkbooks and you have to do immediate things to deal with that. So I understand why that's happening. You look at the long-term trend, it's going in exactly one direction. There are a fixed amount of dead dinosaurs that we can burn. We've found all the ones that were easy to dig up and now the ones are harder to dig up. Oil prices over the long term are only going one way. There's going to be less of it, and they're going to be more concentrated in places where there's a ton of risk to be dependent on, and in Russia, for just one example. So this problem is not going away. All the trends and the tailwinds behind addressing the climate still exist. And so if you ignore the short-term political stuff, things you have to do to counter inflation or scarcity or wars and things like that, there's only one way to go. And that's, yeah, get off this resource, which is going to get increasingly expensive and controlled by people that we don't want to give power to and give more money to. So I'm really optimistic about this space. I also think, especially in this country where action on climate hasn't been at the pace that is needed to solve this problem, I'm super optimistic about things that the private sector is doing to jump in. So there are a number of themes, at least in climate tech, that we've been spending a lot of time on. So electrification of transportation, removing carbon, decarbonizing the grid. And there are a lot of sub-verticals that are going to be really important that will help us get to net zero. And you know, just to give you one example, we invested in an electric bus company called Bossigo, based in Nairobi, Kenya. And they introduced the first electric buses in Nairobi, in Kenya, and soon to be East Africa. And because of the current oil crisis and the rising prices, what we've seen with Bossigo is that they can't keep up with demand. Everyone's like, wait, the bus operators, like we need faster, cheaper, more inexpensive and cleaner buses. And so what can we do to accelerate their growth? So I think we're starting to see really positive outcomes. And this is where the market is going, that we need to electrify transportation. We need to move towards more modern and efficient solutions so we can protect our planet. The one area where the market is not pulling back or pulling back less is in climate tech. So I was just reading something this morning. According to some accounting, there's something like $25 billion in dry powder from recently raised climate-specific funds. That's up a third since just last quarter. So this is an area where despite what's going on in the broader market, people are here to invest. And it's not just the government NGO grant making people. It's Silicon Valley-style climate-specific VCs are still investing. They're here to invest. We're seeing our portfolio companies in climate having an easier time raising than other companies. And that is really good. I'm really excited about that. We got to solve this problem by yesterday. All right. And you guys are obviously focused on health tech too. And Katie, you said your mission is using software to inform better outcomes in different areas. Talk to me a little bit about some of the areas that you're focused in within health tech. Yeah, we have a couple of companies that we're really excited for. One is called VistaPath. It uses AI for pathology based in Cambridge. 
We have another company that is super fun and unique because it's a father-son team. The dad is a dermatologist. The son is a software engineer that's based in Israel called MD Algorithms. They're using AI for dermatology. We have another company in Loom that is advancing women's healthcare based in Los Angeles. Maternal healthcare in America is terrible. And this is a great opportunity for us to just start with women trying to get pregnant, are pregnant or in that newly motherhood phase. So looking at supporting maternal outcomes there too. So lots of great opportunities attacking our healthcare system, making things easier, more accessible, and ultimately creating better outcomes for more people. Well, listen, I took you guys down this kind of horrid Elon Twitter path to start out here because obviously I'm pretty fascinated with the whole thing, but I think your insights are really valuable there to people who are trying to game it and trying to figure out what's going on there. But obviously more important are Moxie's focus on these areas like health and climate tech here. So we really appreciate you guys giving me an update. I hope to get back out there to Boulder. Maybe we'll do a show at Folsom. We'll definitely see a football game in the fall here. So thank you guys for joining us on OK Computer. Thank you for having us. It's always so fun. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Current, and our supporters, Masterworks and Taboola, for bringing you this episode of OK Computer. If you like what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find our show. And we want to hear from you. Email us at contact at riskreversal.com. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at OK Computer Pod. We'll see you next time.